Heavenly Father, send us your spirit to reveal to us our minds and hearts the depths of the baptism of our Lord and our baptism into him. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Last words are important. Last words are important. Famous people uh, say last words and people copying them down into books. Your own family's last words are important to you, and I bet you you, re you remember them. Last words are important, but guess what? First words are also very important. The first words of Jesus in Matthew's gospel is, let it be so. Let it be so. Guess what? His mother said those same words when the angel Gabriel came and gave her notice that she would conceive. Let it be, she said. The first words of Jesus in Matthew's gospel are the words r recognizing that John had no intention to baptize Jesus. John was baptizing as a prophet to prepare the people of Israel for the kingdom of God. And it was a baptism of repentance in the Jordan River, people recognizing that they needed to repent and to cleanse themselves to be prepared for the coming kingdom of God. They were coming to John for this baptism. And guess who shows up? Jesus did. Jesus appeared on his own, of his own will and intention. You know, that thing's been buzzing around all day. <laughs> I missed it. I'm losing it. Uh, Jesus, of his own intention, comes to be baptized by John. And John says, no, I'm a prophet, and I know you're holier than I am, and I need to be baptized by you. But Jesus said, let it be so, for it's proper in this way for us to fulfill all righteousness. There's also an important voice in this passage, the voice of the Father that says, this is my Son, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. Well, this entire passage, this baptism of our Lord, this theophany is a revelation. The first thing it is, is clearly a revelation of the Holy Trinity, which was uh, obscured in the Old Covenant, but is now coming to the very forefront of the revelation, the voice from the Father to the Son, and the coming of the Holy Spirit to light upon Jesus to publicly proclaim that, yes, indeed, this is God's Messiah. The blessed Augustine says, Here, then, we have the Trinity in a certain sort distinguished, the Father in the voice, the Son in the man, the Holy Spirit in the dove. We've got that. That's, a, that's not a stretch but we are going to need the Spirit's help and we're going to have to use our own minds and hearts to understand the depth of what it means for Jesus to fulfill all righteousness and then also to consider our own baptism, which for most of us was a few years ago, right? But we remember it, but the importance of it we may have forgotten it. It may have escaped us. So we are going to spend some time on that as well. Secondly, the baptism of Jesus begins and empowers Jesus to fulfill God's mission of mercy and salvation for this world. That's what it means to fulfill all righteousness. Basically, that language means to fulfill the plan of God. The plan of God, the righteous plan of God, is to restore the creation and those made in his image. The original creation is all good. There's no presence of sin or evil, death or corruption. Those made in his image were fashioned to always be filled with the very life and presence of God. And that's how they were to function. 
They could have gone on forever, so to speak, in that state, but we know the rupture that happened uh, in the disobedience and the fall. So God's righteousness, his plan is to restore the creation, to deal with the chaos of sin and evil and death, and to restore the humanity back to its original design of being filled with the life and love and energy of God. So, Jesus says, let it be, because this is the way I'm going to fulfill the righteous plan of God to set things right, and that's part of what setting righteousness or the righteousness language actually means. Father John Purdom says, being baptized, Jesus follows the script. The script written from the foundation of the world that the Christ of God should descend into the darkest depths of our human condition. That he should let the cold waters of our sins and sorrows close over him. That he should drown in our wretchedness and also that we might live. Now that is a beautiful theological statement right there. The reason Jesus was baptized was not because he had sin in himself or the need to repent. The reason that Jesus was baptized so that he could enter the waters and take on our sin in solidarity with those who are sinful in need of these things. Jesus is going into the water and as he rises up, he's on the way to the cross. And the cross is where those sins that he absorbed, so to speak, in the waters of baptism were placed on him. And he bore those sins in his own body on the tree so that we might live in righteousness and holiness, says Peter the Apostle. And so the baptism of Jesus is at once a Good Friday and an Easter day. Christ's descent into the waters is his death and burial. His emergence from them is his rising from the dead. They are foreshadowed in his baptism. Well, this righteousness of God is also the kingdom of God. Jesus, empowered by the Spirit now at his baptism, is going on his three-year mission and ministry as the Messiah of the Lord. And he is inaugurating the kingdom of God right before their very eyes. Jesus used this language of baptism because his disciples were arguing with one another. He says, what are you all arguing about? Well, we're arguing about which one of us great guys are going to sit at the right hand or the left hand of the kingdom. And he says, can you be baptized with the baptism that I'm about to be baptized with? And they said, sure, but they had no idea that Jesus was speaking of his baptism into the sins of the world which would take place on the cross himself. Well, another thing that uh, is worth noting, and it's one of these scriptures that is probably the, the most mysterious things Paul ever said. He said that God made Christ to be sin, who knew no sin, in order that we could become in Christ the righteousness of God in him. <laughs> now, let me say it again. God made sin, made Christ to be sin, to become sin, to take on our sin, in order that he could die in order that that sin could be condemned, Paul also says that God condemns sin in the flesh of Jesus Christ in Romans 8. God made Christ to be sin for us who knew no sin that we coming into baptism and union with Christ 
could be raised to a new life and become the righteousness of God. So all of this is uh, very deep. Jesus is fulfilling all righteousness, which is the plan of God, the plan to set things right. It is the kingdom of God. It is to defeat the powers of sin and evil and death and create this new heavens and new earth, this life of the age to come, to finally bring us to that point where we are filled with the life and the love, the glory and the energies of God forever and ever. And we are communion with one another in total love, which is a great promise for us, a great promise indeed. Well, a revelation of the Holy Trinity, the theophany, and also the fulfillment of God's plan to save this world and us with it. Third, let's think about our own baptism. The colic for baptism says, Almighty God, by our baptism into the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, you turn us from the old life of sin. Grant that we, being reborn to new life in Him, in Christ, we may live in righteousness and holiness all our days. So, baptism for us, now that Jesus has fulfilled all righteousness, that He has been baptized uh, in solidarity and communion with our sins, that He has preached the Word of God, that He has loved God with all His mind, soul, heart, and strength, and loved His neighbor as Himself. He has fulfilled the law. He has offered Himself totally to the Father as a sacrifice for the sins of His own people. And guess what? We Gentiles get a share in this also. And because Jesus has fulfilled all righteousness, now Christian baptism is available to us. Because the baptism of Jesus is something different than our baptism. We are baptized into Christ's death and resurrection. We're baptized into his death to end an old life. And we're raised to newness of life in Christ to start a new life. That old life of sin, which we are trapped in, we can't get out of it. It's sin and evil, suffering and death itself. That's the old life. We need to get a new life. Thank God that there is baptism. We can die to that old life and we can be raised united with Christ and we're set on, on a course and a new vision where the Spirit and Christ are the empowering factors. This body is still on the way to death. But Paul says that inside we are being renewed day by day. And this renewal, this new life, is what we are concerned with now. He leads us out of our bondage and death into resurrection and eternal life. That's where we are headed. And so, now that Jesus has accomplished all these things, we have a new life in Christ and the gift of the Spirit being united with Christ in his death in baptism. We die to sin. Paul asks the questions in Romans, we who have died to sin, how can we live in it anymore? <laughs> it's a puzzle to Paul that people who have died to sin and Paul didn't take this as some sort of symbolic thing. <laughs> he took it in the most real terms. Uh, since we've left that old life, why would we want to go back to it? When God is giving us this entire new life of Christ and the Spirit and all the riches of the fruits of the Spirit and the promise of eternal life and love and relationship, this is where real life is. Leave the old life behind. And so, this remainder of our life after our baptism is when we choose. Many of us were baptized as infants and don't remember it. How many people were baptized as an infant and don't remember it? Yeah, the majority of people. Uh, I had 16 years of good sin before I finally got baptized. Uh, 
So I, and, 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 you know, it seems like just today I'm catching up with my baptism. You know, the thing about baptism is we get these gifts of God. We get this grace of God. We get the spirit of God. We get Christ. But it takes our whole life to pull it together, to understand it, to even take our first number of steps. Isn't that the truth? That is the truth. God knows this. God is not surprised by this. However, we are called to choose. We're called to choose to continue in this new life. We're called to choose to let go of sin and selfishness. We're called to choose to pursue Christ and the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. We are called to allow God's grace and energies given to us in baptism and continuing in Christ and the Spirit to transform us into the likeness of Christ so that we can continue to be renewed in prayer, obedience, and in the risen life of Christ in the bread and the wine of the Eucharist. So baptism is the end of the old life and the beginning of the new life. We're called to move forward in that new life because life in the Spirit, life in Christ, life in the love of God is really what life is all about. It is really life despite what so many people are confused about today. Well, Jesus has made the ultimate descent to be born as one of us, to be born of Mary, a vulnerable baby. Jesus has descended even further into the baptismal waters to be identified with sinners like you and me. Jesus has descended even further because he descended even into our death. But now Jesus is raised, alive, no longer susceptible to sin or death. They have no claim over him. He's the only one who is in this state, and we're called to follow him through his death and resurrection into that glorious state of life and resurrection. And as we move forward in this life, I want to end with something that I've been reading. There's a, a, a book, and it's by a Romanian nun. Now, before you think that your rector has gone crazy uh, because he's reading books uh, by Romanian nuns, it was recommended by a therapist who is a PhD who trains other therapists, uh, a brilliant person who's also a priest. Uh, and this person recommended this book. Well, I started to read this book, and uh, it was uh, striking uh, because this Romanian nun, Silowana Vlad is her name, she died in 2012, but she gave a series of lectures to clergy, to metropolitans and archbishop and clergy to set them straight about the Christian life, which was just fantastic. Anyway, so uh, she was speaking about her experience as a nun and for many years in Romania, speaking to mostly younger people who had burned out on the search for anything else that would make life work for them. Whatever it is, drug, sex, alcohol, just whatever, whatever you could do. And they finally gave the church a shot, sort of at the end of their rope almost. And they ended up coming to some of her healing sessions and her discussions about the Christian faith and life. And this is all of her years of experience that she's sharing with these metropolitans, archbishops, and priests, and whatnot. And what she says is fascinating. She says that what we have to do is allow Jesus to descend into our real life. Our real life. Not up here, but down in here, or down in here. Because Jesus, the Christ, is risen. And he is alive. And he is eternal life. And he is the great physician. 
And she says, we allow Jesus to descend in our, to our real life, into our real feelings, our real thoughts, to descend where the pain, where the fear, where the loneliness, where the confusion, where the murky waters are that we don't even know what is going on, but we know it's not right. She says, invite Jesus down into that place. He's already been baptized for you and died for your sins. He knows everything. He wants to be with you, and he will be there with you and illuminate your mind and heart to the meaning of it. And he will strengthen us, and he will heal us, and he will walk with us through that out to the other side because only really he has the power to do that. I was just captivated by this thought of not saying, Jesus, you can't come to my darkest places, but rather inviting Jesus to be there with us in all his love and healing power. It's just an extraordinary thought that he would, in fact, do that but the gospel says that he certainly will if he's invited in. And so, today as we renew our own baptismal vows, we do that so that we can truly continue to walk in holiness and righteousness in Christ all our days. Amen. Amen.